Um, thank you for uh, revelation of yourself and your faithfulness and your goodness and your constancy, Lord, and, and just your patience with your people um, and your graciousness, Lord. We pray that you would just, Holy Spirit, bless your word to us this morning, encourage us, focus our minds and our hearts and our wills upon you and uh, make us more into Christ's image, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Hey, Dan, so, before, we, before we get going, I just tried to start recording and my computer told me it's not going to do that successfully. Uh, maybe Matthew, would you be willing to record? Yep, done. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks, Dan. Go ahead. No problem. Okay. So, um, so we're, we're looking, we're going through this study in Exodus and um, Ben uh, got us started last week. Um, looking at uh, chapters one and two. Today we're looking at chapters three and four. And um, it's uh, the first part, of course, was the earlier life of Moses, um, how he was preserved. And uh, even though it was, it was by edict, the, the Egyptians were going <clears> to <throat> kill all of the male children of the Hebrews. Um, and he was preserved and then raised in, in Pharaoh's uh, courts. And, um, and then we saw when he was an adult, when he was 40, he um, thought it was time to liberate um, the Israelites from the Egyptian oppression and took that into his own hands and didn't work. Um, so <clears throat> killing one of the Egyptians and did not get the support he was expecting from his own countrymen. And so, so, um, so today we're looking at Moses and it's been 40 years um, since uh, that time. And he um, has fled and fled from Egypt, went into Midian and um, self-imposed exile there for 40 years and so we're we're going to look i just broke it down into three three parts here um god appears to moses in um chapter three verses one through nine and god sends moses chapter three ten through 22 and then and then some of the transitional preparations that are um that transpire in chapter four, verses 18 through 31. Um, and then there's um, a section where God also empowers um, Moses for the, the mission that he has assigned him. And so I'm only gonna read one section of this scripture today. There's, there's a lot of verses and that'll be the, the second, second set of verses. Um, so let me just describe here um, I, what is going on in the first, first nine verses of chapter three. And keeping in mind that this study is the birth of a nation. And um, of course, that is no, that's no small thing. Um, God started with just Abraham and, and um, Sarah and, and his family um, and has grown them in the land of Egypt and to probably approximately two or three million people. And then he is, um, but they're in a, a foreign land and it's not their own. It's not their own country. And, and um, there's, there's um, fear from the part of the Egyptians on how great the Israelites have become in number and in strength. And so they're um, mistreating them to, you know, keep them from growing powerful and that sort of thing. And, and so the next thing that you would need, of course, is a place uh, to be a nation, uh, land. And, and um, that's what is, you know, they're heading towards. And, and every nation has a leader as well, or leaders. And Moses and is that person that is going to lead them out of Egypt and into Canaan. And God is going to displace the people that are in Canaan and give them that land. 
And so, as I said, Moses is in, in Midian. He, he went there um, and um, is, has been working as a shepherd there for his father-in-law. Um, and he's tending sheep um, there, and he's been doing that uh, much, much different than from where he started, which was in the courts of Pharaoh, which is very, very luxurious existence. And we know from Hebrews that he was willing to forsake that and to identify with his people. And so um, he probably didn't think that he would wind up uh, tending sheep. He probably thought he would be with his people immediately, but there was this 40 year uh, parentheses for him. And so here he is, he's tending sheep uh, one day um, for his father-in-law and he's, uh, he comes to um, Mount Horeb, which is also known as Sinai, which is where the, the law is given. And it's the mountain of God. And um, we find here that, that God appears to him and Moses, it seems like uh, in the periphery of his vision, he notices that there is a bush that is burning um, and yet it is not consumed. And it's, we know it's a thorn bush from Acts chapter seven. And, and so um, something that would normally just be consumed pretty, pretty readily, but it just continues to burn and the bush, the bush remains in the midst of the fire. And so Moses is intrigued, he's curious. And so he leaves off his shepherding duties for, for this and um, goes to investigate. He's going to see what this is about. And so he starts to approach and, and the Lord, the Lord calls to Moses from the bush and um, calls his name twice, which is God does that often. And Moses answers, here I am. And, um, and he warns him not to come near it. Um, and to uh, remove his sandals and know that it was holy ground because the reason it was holy ground is because God's presence was there. Um, and so uh, he's to remove his sandals as well and not come any closer. You cannot approach God. That's the state of all of us um, uh, is we are not allowed to approach God being sinners. Um, completely and at this point and so so he's told to take off his sandals um, which was a common thing in in that day and age um, it symbolized you know just taking off um, something that would have all the dirt of the world from where you've been in the world and um, not bringing it into wherever or wherever you're going and so it's necessary to be able to approach God to some extent and so, so then, um, then God explains why he has come in verses seven through nine. And um, he identifies himself as the God of Moses' father and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and then Moses, in response, he hid his face in fear. And, and then um, God tells him that he's aware that his people are suffering intense affliction under this, the Egyptian oppression and that he has heard their cry to him. Um, last week we, mentioned, we noticed that it wasn't clear whether or not they um, were praying or pleading to God directly, the, their God, or just complaining in a general sense, and God was aware of their murmuring. But if you look at, De at Deuteronomy 26, 7, it's clear that they actually were praying to God, and he heard their cry to him. And so they do have at least that, uh, that much of their, their faith uh, working, um, praying to the right God. And, and so he has heard them. Uh, he's heard their cry. And he's giving heed. Now is the time. He's he's responding, um, and he has come to deliver them from the bondage of Egypt, and to bring them out uh, 
of that land to the land of Canaan, uh, which is going to be their land. And it's a spacious and plentiful land um, well, where they will be free um, from the Egyptian oppression. Um, it's, it will be an abundant land flowing with milk and honey. And so, so he has instructed Moses as to what he has come for. <clears throat> and, and then um, in verses 10 through 22, we're going to look at, he, um, he gives Moses his commission. Let, let me just stop there for a minute and just allow any, any questions or comments about this, this first nine verses of chapter three. If uh, Matthew, you would unmute everyone. Yeah, anyone should be able to unmute themselves now. Anybody have any thoughts or questions? Well, the first Dan, verse? Dan, perhaps I, uh, I knew this at one point and by virtue of uh, old age and, and loss of memory, I had forgotten uh, the connection that, that Horeb and Sinai were the same place. Uh, but Amy and I were just taking a look at that, and I, I couldn't help but kind of think over to Hebrews, where it talks about the mountain that burned with fire, you know, which is not the mountain to which we've come. And there he's talking about the giving of the law. Um, but even in this instance here, we see, you know, a lot of awe and um, fear and reverence and distance, um, which is just, you know, Hebrews puts that in really strong contrast to not that God is no longer consuming fire, you know, but we have this great high priest uh, who makes 110% of the difference um, in how we relate to that burning fire. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And, you know, that's what God chose, how God chose to manifest himself it's in that burning fire. Um, could have been a lot of other things that he could have chose, but that, that is what he chose. And, and you're right. Um, it is different for us now. Thank, thank God that we, um, we approach uh, through a different, a different means through Christ. That there is that fear uh, that was supposed to be projected. Anybody else have any comments or? Hey, Dan. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, in verse 7, at the very end there, it says, for I am aware. Uh, do you have, um, what does your version say? I am aware. Does anybody have anything different? Because that's, that's I I'm looking at my Hebrew text there, and it's, it's one of the most important Hebrew root words in all of Scripture. It's the word that's used to describe sexual intercourse between a man and woman. So it speaks to the intimacy of his knowledge, not like this, there's this God who just happened to look down and say, oh yeah, you're, you guys are going through difficulty. He's, he's intimately aware. He's personally aware of their difficulties, which to me speaks of this caring, nurturing, loving, merciful, gracious God that uh, we serve, not this distance, remote kind of God. It's, 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 there's tremendous intimacy in that word there. I, I was just curious if you had run across any of that uh, in, in regards to, uh, you know, for I'm aware of their sufferings. Yeah, so is that probably translated, I, I know their sufferings? Uh, yeah, yes. Somewhere else? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good... King, that's, King James says, I surely have seen. But it's also, it sounds kind of distant, I have seen. Yeah, New King James says no. Well, it's, you know, that's a good point because, um, you know, over 400 years have passed now. Um, people are probably wondering, I mean, I mean, they're... You know, they were given the, the prophecies to Abraham, you know, that there would be a 430 year or 400 year stint. Um, and, but still, when you're in the midst of, of this oppression, uh, you're wondering when is God going to act? When is he going to come through on his promise? And as Dave said, God is, he's very aware. He knows he knows intimately what it, what they're going through. Reminds me of Hagar when she flees. Um, you know, she gets in the fight with Sarah and she flees the house. And you know, God is the God that that hears and cares for her, right? And he 
he speaks to her about Ishmael, same sort of thing. And that's in a personal sense. This is in a, in a national sense, but he's aware of all their sufferings as a nation. And um, so it's, it's, I guess that's timely in some sense. We're not, we're not Israel, but we are a nation. Um, and, and the church itself, God is aware of our, our situation where we are today. So, um, Hey, Dan, um, he's one, one yes. interesting tie in there, and I don't want to go too far down a, a rabbit trail here and take away your time, but you think about Christ when he appeared on the uh, road to Damascus to Saul. And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not my church, but me. Um, so again, that kind of like Dave was talking about, that union of Christ with his people, or the union of God with his people in the experience of their sufferings is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty intimate there. Yeah, yeah, good point. Thank you. Dan, Dan? Yes. Mine reads, uh, this is NASB, says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. Or in Egypt, and I'm giving heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. Yeah. Verse 7. Yep. Yeah, I think Dave was referring to the last part of that verse where it says, For I am aware of their sufferings. Oh, yeah, okay. I got it. Yes. Anybody else have any comments? Okay, let me, um, let me read verses 10 through 22, and then we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> God, God speaking here. Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you, will, you, will, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will pay heed to what you say. And you, with the elders of Israel, will come to the king of Egypt. And you will say to him, the Lord, the God of, Hebrew, of the Hebrews, this has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. And I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and a woman who lives in her house, articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. Okay, so, so here um, it's quite a different, quite a different situation than um, in the first couple of chapters of Exodus. Um, I underscored that here God commissions Moses to bring his people out of Egypt. I think um, Moses took it upon himself. Uh, we saw last time to um, liberate his people. And he found that, that his self-appointed time was not the right time. Um, we looked in Acts 7.25, we also see that it says the people didn't understand uh, what he was doing. Uh, in other words, they didn't, they didn't support him in what he was doing. Um, and so, so, so this is different. 
Um, before he didn't he didn't have God commissioning him, and he didn't have the support of God's people. But now, God is sending him, and God tells him now they will listen. The elders will listen, and so so this is a different situation. This is going to be a successful um, mission for for Moses uh, because it is God's will, and so. Um, then Moses um, has a little different response. He's very, he's very different from what he was in, in those first two chapters. He was rash and impetuous and self-confident in, in his earlier life. But here he shows these, this quality of being sort of reticent. Um, and he has these objections that he raises to God about carrying out this mission that he's assigned to him. And so, so he raises these objections and God answers them. And the first one that he raises is, who am I that I should go before Pharaoh and deliver the sons of Israel? And, and so that's his first, first objection. Um, and things have changed. He's no longer, he's a, he's a shepherd now. He's no longer, he has no cloud in the, in the courts of Pharaoh. Um, he has, um, it's just him and his family. Um, he has, he, he's just been doing what he's been doing for 40 years. Um, he hasn't been there. He has no relationships with his people there. And so, who am I? He says, who am I to go and carry this out? And God's answer is um, not really to tell Moses that he's someone great uh, or that he's, he's, uh, he's the great liberator that he needs to be, but he says that he will be with him, which makes all the difference. God promises to be with him. It sounds very much like um, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28, right? Lo, I'll be with you unto the end of the ages. Very similar uh, promise that God has made to him. And then he also gives him a sign. Um, and it's a sign that's to come. Um, it's not a sign that he was to experience before he carried out the mission, but it's a sign that will follow. And it's uh, basically a promise that, that he will serve God um, at this mountain, um, when he is, when Moses has brought them out of out of Egypt, and so it's it's basically he's he's giving him, him a certainty of deliverance that they will make it, they will come to uh, this mountain and and um, they will worship God and serve Him, and so that is God's answer to his concern about his own smallness and inadequacy in that sense, in position. Um, and then his, his next objection is, what do I tell the sons of Israel if they ask the name of the one who has sent me? So he's concerned about, okay, well, I'm going to go to the Israelites who I haven't seen in 40 years and tell them what, what I have heard, what has been told me, and what I'm supposed to do. And what if they ask who has sent me? Because they would want to know by what authority he is going to do this. And God's response is, I am who I am. I am has sent you. And which is a curious, it's a curious statement, uh, of course. <laughs> uh, to me, when I re first read that statement, if I read it out of out of any other context, I would think this sounds like something to be discussed in a philosophy class or a theology class uh, about, about God's existence. And um, it's a simple statement, but it generates all kinds of, all kinds of uh, discussions and um, things about the attributes of God. And so, so it is interesting, but he makes this statement in a particular context, in the context of going before God's people 
Um, and this is who he's to identify as giving him authority. And, and so if I were the Israelites, what would I, what would I deduce from that? If I heard that I am who I am, or I am has sent you. Um, I put, let me pose that question to you guys. Uh, what would you think if you were the Israelites? Anybody can unmute themselves and, and comment on this. Why, why do you think God um, made this statement in this context? Anybody want to comment on that? Okay. Well, I, I'll come in. Did somebody start to? Oh, I was just trying to say that it doesn't really, when you just say I am, and it doesn't say a proper name, you know, so it seems like it would kind of, um, kind of make the children of Israel curious, I guess. Like, I don't know. <laughs> That's true, because, you know, they're surrounded by, all the Egyptians, the Egyptians had myriad of gods, gods for all kinds of things, frogs and alligators and snakes, and right? So, um, and they had gods that, you know, ushered people from life to death, and there, there was just all, they, they did certain things, or um, they were associated with a particular creature. Um, but in this instance, it is a statement about his nature, um, really. So yeah, it would make you curious. Anybody else um, have a comment? Uh, Dan, I was just thinking, didn't God say to Abraham, his name was I am? I don't think he said, no, he didn't say that to, to Abraham. Are you thinking of John chapter eight, where Jesus said before Abraham was I am? Yeah, I guess that's what I was thinking. Yeah, he didn't say that to Abraham. Uh, Jesus said that to the, the Pharisees. Oh, okay. Dan, I think that, you know, the I am, to me, that speaks to his eternality. And clearly, Pharaoh's not eternal, and there's nothing about anything of the gods of Egypt that are eternal. And therefore, by definition, he's greater. And um, and so he's he's really communicating to Moses, what exactly Genesis 1-1 really says, in the beginning God created. I mean, it, he is eternal and unchanging. And so I think it's it just, because he's the creator, therefore he's gotta be greater than his creation by definition. So that's what that says to me. That's a great, yeah, I think, I think when I reflect on this, what struck me was, like you, you mentioned, things change. So, so pharaohs have come and gone. Um, they were in favor. The Israelites were in favor. Now they're not in favor. Um, and, and they were being allowed to exist um, peacefully there. Now they're being mistreated. Um, and it's been 400 years. Um, but God has not changed. And he made a promise 400 years before um, to give them a land. He spelled it out, or he, or he talked of it to Abraham, and um, and so um, he he hasn't changed at all. Um, his it's not possible for him. He is immutable, and so his commitments to those promises will never wane. Um, nothing could could affect him um, to renege on those things. Um, and so it is, it's, I think it is about his self-existence. Um, he's not dependent on anything or anyone um, to accomplish what he says he will do. He's also not subject to time. So even though so much time has passed, it's all in a perfect present uh, experience for him. And so it's not as if, as if this long four centuries plus have, have transpired for him, where he might have grown weary or forgotten about what he had promised. And so 
So it's a, it's a tremendous statement. Um, when you think about it more outside of even the context, it's, it boggles the mind because God has no beginning, no end. And he never changes. He's complete. Um, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't, it's, it's, uh, it's fruit for a lot of thought. But above all, you would have to think, I think, that he is able and faithful to free his nation. Okay. And as I mentioned to Shashi that, you know, this was one of the attributes that Jesus claimed for himself in John 8. Um, and the context of offering eternal life to anyone who kept his word. Uh, before Abraham was, I am in that discussion. And so I think he, he cites that, this quality um, to assure deliverance from Egypt and um, ultimately as in Jesus to assure deliverance from sin. Um, he also says um, in response to that question, I am the Lord God of your father, fathers, and of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that has sent you. And that's very important also. Um, that was the covenant name, the Lord God. And, um, and so it's, it's hearkening back to the commitment, the agreement that the, he had made to Abraham and to his offspring. And he says it's an everlasting name to all generations. And, um, and then he assures Abraham that the elders will listen and will accompany you before Pharaoh. Um, and he instructs him, you know, to go, go ask Pharaoh for three days journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the God of the Hebrews. Um, and so this is, in one sense, this is kind of a setup, so, so to speak. It's not deceptive, but it, um, it, this was a common thing. Groups of groups of people in um, in Egypt, whether um, according to which God they served, um, would would commonly uh, ask for leave to go and worship their their God and sacrifice their God to their God. Um, and so this is something that that wouldn't have been out of the ordinary to be asked of the Pharaoh. And um, and so he. He tells Moses to make that appeal, and he knows that he will deny it, and he'll deny that concession uh, for them to go practice their religion, and he will not listen, it says in verse 19. And, um, and so it just sets it up so that um, this is another one of those instances where, you know, um, we obey God. Um, we are going to worship our God. You know, it, even if the authorities over us forbid that and will not allow that. And so, so the other thing, which was, and this was really, this is interesting also, this is another little detail. They've been exploited and uh, used as slaves and paid nothing by the Egyptian people uh, for some time. And now when they leave, um, God is going to affect the people of Egypt to favor the sons of Israel. And as they leave, when they ask the Egyptians for valuables, they're going to oblige. And this was promised to Abraham 430 years ago in Genesis 15, 22. And um, so there's that detail. Um, he promised, you know, he foretold that they would suffer uh, and be in bondage um, to a nation. But in parting, they would basically... Um, take the spoils from, from the people of Egypt that had been exploiting them. Um, and then let's, uh, let's look at the beginning of chapter four here. Um, anybody want to say anything about, about that section? We're getting... All right, let's move on because I'm eating up my time here. Uh, his third objection, um, Moses says, is what if they do not believe what I say, what my report, basically? And so God's response is, okay, well, I will give you, I will give you these powers um, to perform miraculous signs before them. And hey, he just asks him, hey, what's that staff in your hand? Or what's that in your hand? And Moses says, a staff. And he 
throws it on the ground and turns to a snake and then he picks it up by the tail and turns back into a staff. And so that was one, one of the things that he was going to be able to do. And he sticks his, tells him to stick his hand in his breast and pull it out and it's white as snow with leprosy and then do it, stick it in there again and it comes out healed. And that was the second sign. And then the third was if he was to uh, scoop up water from the Nile and cast it on the ground, it would, it would turn to blood. And so um, those are the miraculous signs that he was to have uh, to authenticate uh, his ministry. And um, by the way, which is, which is only, uh, is not a perpetual thing, a perpetual um, practice of God throughout all of, all of his relationship with humanity. It, it happens really in a few major instances in history. And then in between you find long periods of silence as we are, are in now, I think, for the most part, in a period of, of the, uh, the gifts, those are miracles not really happening. But he does, God um, applies those pointedly to give authenticity to um, something great, something dramatic that's being done. For example, the establishing of the church or the establishing of a nation, a couple of instances here. And so, um, Moses' last um, objection um, is that he, he's slow of speech. Um, he's got a heavy tongue. He, uh, he's not able to speak effectively or eloquently. And, um, and so that, he brings that to the Lord's attention. And the Lord replies to him, you know, don't you know I'm, your, I'm the creator? I make... I make people mute or deaf or blind or seeing, basically. It's like, I can do anything. I can make anybody able or unable to do anything. Um, and, um, but God says, you know, I'm going to be your mouth, and I will teach you what to say. And, and so um, that's how it responds to Moses' Moses objection. Um, Moses is still not convinced. And resists further, and I, I think he basically, you know, um, let's see if I can find that verse. Verse 13, he says, but, but he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever thou wilt. And, and I take that as him saying, you know, he's either a, a sign of resignation of like, just send anyone, I guess I'll go, or send, send anybody but me, that sort of thing. And the reason I think that it's it's a negative statement is God in the next um, next verse fourteen is burning with anger, right? He's, his patience has grown thin with this, and so um, God still accommodates him though, and He appoints uh, Moses' older brother Aaron to the Levite to speak to the people. So He makes this this arrangement where God will speak to Moses, Moses will speak to Aaron and Aaron will relay that to to Israel and so um, that's the this the final arrangement of how the communications are going to go um, and so it's an interesting thing though um, why do you think I'm, I'm going to pose this this question because we're running out of time but but um, why do you think Moses um, is reluctant to go in this instance, why does he raise all the, these objections? I mean, if you're thinking back to the Moses of 40 years ago, he was very gung ho, um, seemed fearless, and, you know, and a man of action. But here, here he's like he's just putting on the brakes. He's dragging his feet, you know, digging them into the ground. It looks like. What do you guys think? Um, I've always looked at this as the humiliation of what happened to him in Egypt, you know, killing somebody and then, and then um, <clears throat> ending up as a shepherd, the, the humiliation of that was still with him. It was like, you know, just didn't want anything to do with trying to stand up and be a leader in any way. But that's just my impression. That's a, I think that's a good point, Kristen, because, you know, if it,
Hey, Dan, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but I think we lost you. You might want to try to reconnect. Just uh, make one quick note while we're waiting for Dan. If you look over at Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, I know we'll get to here shortly. God says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, which has the same root as this I am that I am, or this Jah. Um, he says, by that name I was not known to them. So this Exodus 3 revelation of this name I am that I am was something new. Uh, that had not been revealed to the patriarchs. Still talking about Dan's question. I mean, this is a filler, if you will, not that I'm trying to fill, but I was, I was going to say that I, I agree with what Kristen's saying, and, and Dan was agreeing with her. So we're all on the same page. I just couldn't make a comment that I like it. <laughs> you know, that, that God uses someone that's humble. He calls someone that's humble and someone that is not raising up himself to say, Lord, use me, you know, send me, you know, that type of, of thing. You know, we see some, you know, great pastors who, whose father was a pastor and they made a profession of faith that, an early age and they were an outstanding college student and athlete and all American, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. and they go into and they have an amazing career proclaiming the word of God. It, I like to see this. God chooses the humble, the resistant, and by his sovereign grace draws them forward and enables them. Uh, so that all the signs point to the Lord anyway. You know, when, uh, when Paul is describing the gospel ministry to the Corinthian church, he says, we have this treasure, you know, it's in, it's in broken vessels um, so that the, the power and the glory goes to God, is ascribed to God um, and not to the vessel. But I agree with you. We tend to do that. We think about, oh, think of so-and-so and the platform they have and the recognition they have. Oh, if they got saved, just think yeah. about, you know, how they could impact the kingdom. Yeah. And, and often God uses the weak. You know, I was wondering about this um, this whole part, uh, and, and in a way, it was just showing that he wasn't secure in his belief yet, and that, and that as a contrast, when at the end of the chapter, when he goes and he proclaims all these signs and he tells all of the elders um, what he has seen, it said that they 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 bowed their heads in worship. They believed. Actually, it says at the beginning of verse 31, the people believed and they heard the Lord who visited the children of Israel and that he looked on their affliction. They bowed their heads in worship. And I was wondering if this was a kind of a contrast between Moses at this point in terms of his belief and the people at the end seeing the same, seeing less, not having the word, the actual word of God proclaimed to them. And they believed, though obviously didn't carry on to the next chapter. But um, anyway, it's just it was like a contrast to me. I'm just wondering if maybe that might be part of it too. Mm -hmm. So Dan's got the answer when he gets back. I I was just thinking um, maybe forty years with the sheep in the wilderness, they truly just lost uh, the practice of articulation. I don't know. What about that? I, I hear what you're saying, Shashi. He, he truly felt like he had not been talking to too many people beyond sheep. Yeah. And I would expect to the degree that he had been talking. It was probably in the language of the Midianites um, with his father-in-law Jethro and his wife and probably not Egy Egyptian. Hey, Matthew. Uh, I along with what you were saying about Paul, uh, that came to my mind, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, when he said, I did not come to you with superiority of speech or wisdom. And then 
but in verse four, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words, but of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and of power that your faith should. Re so to me, that's really, I mean, Paul looked at that. It's not about me because remember, chap, you know, they were, they were um, the false teachers were saying that this man, Paul, you don't want to listen to him because his speech by Mercy, Second Corinthians chapter 11 and says, for they say that my, my, my uh, letters are weighty and strong, but the personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. And so, you know, they were accusing Paul of that. So I think a messenger of God, like, like Paul and like Moses, understands who's in control and who is leading and who is directing. And it's not about your abilities, i.e. Moses, you know, I can't speak, I, you know, I can't speak in front of people. I, I would say the same thing, but the issue is the power of the Holy Spirit through the message of the word. And I think that Paul understood that. And I think Moses began to understand that. Just my thoughts. I think it's interesting to see that, you know, in every age as God has worked with his people, the power has been his and the, uh, the preeminence has been his and uh, no one else's. So he's jealous for his own glory in that way. But uh, Dan just texted and said he's still having technical difficulties. So why don't we just wrap up with prayer here and then we can stop the recording and dismiss into uh, any groups of folks who would like to fellowship. My family and I need to drop off as we are headed over to Hillcrest this morning, but uh, ben, can, ben can administer from here. So I'll pray for us and we'll uh, hand it back over to Ben. Lord, thank you for uh, this look into your word this morning and for the ability that we have here to see the experiences of Moses and his humiliation and humbling and learning uh, to receive a commission from your hand rather than take it up on his own and for your faithfulness to the promises that you've made and uh, your commitment, your devotion to your people, uh, your feeling and knowing your people um, in a truly intimate way um, and your revelation of yourself as the self-existing, always existing God, uh, sufficient within yourself in purpose and in power. We pray, Lord, that we might honor you today um, as Jehovah, as the one who always has been and always will be, that we might reverence you in the way that is appropriate. And thank you again for this time and for Dan's preparation, and I'm um, asking you to bless uh, the rest of our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.